Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the windblown ruggedness of Admiralty Island off the coast of Alaska. On the south end of the island is Pibus Bay, which is fairly large and open. On the north end of the bay is a small peninsula like jut of land that pokes out a bit. At this point in the bay, the beach is tangled with fallen trees and stumps, making navigation and vision very difficult. The beach gives way to dense groves of spruce and fir with alder, willow, and devil's club, obscuring any hope anyone would have vision past a few yards. It is in this dangerous and wild setting that our episode today takes place. On the morning of Monday, April 26, 2004, 39-year-old Scott Newman had led a bear hunting client of his for the past nine days on a so far fruitless brown bear hunt. His client was a textile manufacturer from Mexico City, whom we will refer to as Juan. With Juan's wife and Scott's nephew, Levi Newman, acting as assistant guide and cook, the hunting trip took on a family-friendly quality to it. Scott was an avid outdoorsman and had been guiding hunts for 17 years. A little over 12 years ago, he started up his own guiding operation and was now doing it for his own business. Field and Stream magazine reported him as a superb guide, and many of his clients agree. For the prior nine days, the hunters would get up early and wolf down breakfast and coffee and either hit a trail to a nearby ridge or hop in the skiff to look for bears along the edges of the bay. Each day they would glass the hillside from any vantage point they could find, but just weren't seeing a lot of bears. In fact, they had only seen nine bears to this point, and were becoming a little frustrated with the lack of cooperation they were getting from the bears. They are supposed to be out looking for food to break their winter fast of hibernation, but they were just not there. After passing on a decent bear on the fifth day of the hunt, their prospects were looking bleak. On the tenth and final day of the hunt, they spotted a good brown bear boar toward the middle of the bay on a little peninsula that pokes out a bit. Scott knew that this was the last best chance they would have at bagging a bear, even if it wasn't the giant bruiser they were looking for. He piloted the boat downwind several hundred yards and quietly anchored their skiff and disembarked. Scott decided they would make the final approach on foot, which would give them a better chance to look the bear over and place a shot that would humanely conclude the hunt. As the hunters closed in on the bear, they could see him doing something behind a group of dead fall logs on the beach. They would see his massive head pop up and down, and then one of his legs would poke out of the tangle. Then it would look as if it was moving off a bit, and then it would start all over again. It is possible that the bear was digging for razor clams, which are a large-sized clam species that buries itself on the sandy shores along the sea in the area. Bears love them and spend as much time as needed to dig them out and devour them. Each one goes on average at about 0.63 ounces of meat, which is rich in nutrients and fat, so it is a good food source for bears. Scott kept an eye on the bear as the men navigated the deadfall trees littering the shore. They would have to crawl under some or over others, all while making sure the wind stayed in their favor as they approached the bear. The hunters managed to stalk within 140 yards of the bear before running out of cover. They had no other means to get closer to him and remain hidden, so Scott had Juan set up to shoot on a log, and they began waiting for a good shot on the bear. The fickle winds on the island concerned Scott a bit. He knew they might change at any moment, so after a little while, he decided to try something new. In the tangle of stumps and tree trunks, the bear still managed to stay obscured as the hunters approached. Scott decided a better angle was in order and began crawling on his belly toward the edge of the shoreline. He was hoping to see the bear's position, but what the bear did next would put the entire hunting party at risk. As Scott belly crawled while holding his rifle and binoculars, he glanced back toward Juan and noticed he had his rifle down and wasn't ready to shoot. The bear decided he should investigate this new scent that had swirled into his nostrils as the wind shifted slightly. The boar-brown bear leapt upon the crisscrossed log jam and stared toward the hunters. Juan was so excited by seeing the bear at such close range and presenting such a large portion of his body as a target that he drew down on the bear while it was facing directly toward him. Now whenever you hunt, your goal should always be a broadside shot. This allows the greatest opportunity for your projectile, whether bullet, arrow, or spear, to slice through as many vital organs as possible. 
The likelihood of your projectile striking both lungs while the animal is broadside are much higher than if you fire at them while they face you directly. In addition, the likelihood of a bullet breaking down any portion of the bear's shoulders or hips in a front-facing shot are very small, meaning they can still come after you, even if they are mortally wounded. As the bear popped up on top of one of the logs, Juan fired a bullet and hit center mass. The shot he fired was a fatal shot, in about 20 minutes, but 20 minutes of time spent with an irate brown bear might be your last 20 minutes of life. Juan fired a total of three shots, before Scott could tell him to wait until the bear was broadside. When he heard Juan's rifle fire through its entire load, Scott fired a few rounds from his .416 caliber Remington Magnum hunting rifle with its 400 grain bullets. The men watched as the massive bear streaked across the beach and into the nearby brush and disappeared. Just for the record, a 416 is bigger than that kitty shotgun your grandpa showed you how to shoot sparrows with, the 410. It has a massive bullet which travels at 2,400 feet per second and delivers 5,100 pounds per square inch. Scientists say that brown bear bone is ten times as dense as human bone, and to keep them from getting to you when you tick one off, you better make sure a few of those important brown bear bones don't work anymore. None of Juan's bullets struck a large bone. After the shooting stopped, Juan and Scott discussed their next steps. Scott's mind was filled with an upcoming hunt in a few days, and this hunt took longer than he had hoped. Since it was the final day of Juan's hunt, Scott thought it best to immediately trail the wounded bear, for no better reason that it was walking off with more lead in its body right now than most men could carry in a backpack. It was now 7 p.m., and darkness would be closing in in less than two hours. The thought of coming back in the morning to resume tracking the bear, skinning it, and packing the hide out had occurred to Scott. The other option was to check on the blood trail that the bear had left and see if he could get a good sense of how fatal its injuries were. Scott opted for the latter of the two options, and the hunters cautiously approached the last point they saw the bear. They could see where the bear's tracks were and where the blood trail started. It was a good blood trail, with a wide path meaning the bear was bleeding from both sides of his body. This was a good sign to Scott, as he knew the bear couldn't possibly keep bleeding like this for very long before it bled out. As they tracked the blood trail, they found a long strip of bear scat alongside the blood and tracks. This is an indication that the bear is in distress, and it is emptying its bowels in a desperate attempt at escape. Scott estimated the bear had taken around six bullets fired from both rifles. There was no way this bear could absorb that much punishment and damage and live for very long. Scott followed the blood trail into the brush, alertly circling for a different perspective as he followed. As the blood trail continued, Scott began to grow a bit concerned. The blood trail was ample in amount, but was dark which means that it is coming from somewhere closer to the gut area, as opposed to the lungs. Blood from the lungs is usually brighter in color and can be frothy in appearance. Scott knew that this was a bad sign and that the bear was likely still alive and very angry. As Scott reviewed the track evidence in front of him, he kept a careful eye on the direction of travel of the tracks, watching for a telltale circle trend in the tracks which can indicate an ambush. Just as he looked back down toward the ground, he caught a faint whiff of bear scent. He heard an ominous twig snap and quickly slipped his safety off on his rifle. As soon as the bear heard the click of Scott's safety, the ground shook with a roar so loud that it could disorient people. He glanced up and saw the bushes whipping and snapping as the bear mowed its way through and toward Scott. Just as the bear emerged from the brush, Scott could see the bear's right paw pulled back and ready to strike. He shouldered his rifle and leaned in to absorb its jolting kick and squeeze the trigger. Scott could see the fur on the bear's chest part from the impact of the bullet. The shot was fired from only ten feet away, as the bear was facing him straight on and didn't have any significant effect on its advance. Scott quickly worked his bolt action and did what he called short-stroked the action of his rifle. What likely happened was he was in such a hurry to reload another shell that the prior shell didn't eject fully, ramming the new unspent shell into the backside of the spent cartridge. Scott feverishly worked to dislodge the spent shell from his rifle, but the bear was upon him before he could clear the jam. 
The enraged boar plowed into Scott going full speed, knocking him clean off his feet and onto his back. Scott knew he had to fight back and began kicking the bear repeatedly in the head. He knew he couldn't allow this bear to get a hold of his neck or head, or his life would be over quicker than the bear could toss his head. The bear clamped its jaws onto Scott's left foot, driving his shattered foot bones through the skin. Searing pain forced an eruption of profanity from Scott's mouth that would make a sailor blush. The bear pulled his head back and removed Scott's left boot in the process. Scott shoved the butt of his rifle into the bear's mouth and it bit down hard. He held his hands to push the bear away, but the snapping jaws of the bear quickly crunched through them. Next it worked its way up his left leg a few inches, crunching bones and tearing tissues the entire time. Scott was still trying to work the action of his rifle, hoping that he could shoot the bear before it was able to do fatal damage to him. Scott knew that damage to his lower legs would be painful, but probably not fatal. That is when the bear focuses its jaws on his left thigh muscle. It bit and tore his thigh muscle, rending huge chunks of tissue and flesh away with each bite. The enraged and wounded bear picked Scott up by his thigh muscle and flipped him upside down while shaking him back and forth. The warm blood gushed from his thigh wounds and ran down his skin inside of his pants. Then the bear dropped him and backed off a few steps. Scott could tell that the bear had begun to feel the deadly effects of the bullets. The attack was only about 30 seconds from when Scott fired the shot from 10 feet away from the bear until it turned away from him. In those 30 seconds, the bear had torn Scott's body up severely and unimaginably. The bear stood just three feet from Scott, glaring at him. He tried to close the bolt on his rifle, but could see the firing pin was stuck, preventing him from putting the bear down. Somehow, he still managed to get away. Each time he stepped on his left foot, it would fold up on him, so he hopped along on his left heel until he was a safe distance. Scott sat down and began yelling for help. He then pulled out his handheld radio and reached out to the Coast Guard, telling them he needed a medical helicopter now. He hadn't assessed his thigh wound very much yet, but was concerned that his femoral artery had been damaged or torn and he may bleed to death quickly. It was only a few minutes before Levi and a worker at a nearby lodge were at his side. He was a bloody mess, and it seemed like his blood was leaking from every pore in his body. Scott remained calm and never lost consciousness while Levi and the worker stabilized him as they waited for the Coast Guard helicopter, which arrived about 90 minutes after the attack. The medical helicopter flew Scott out to the Sitka Community Hospital in Sitka, Alaska. He spent 23 days there and another 60 days recovering from home in Petersburg. The brown bear had left Scott with 32 puncture wounds over his hands, one arm, his left leg, and foot. The following day, Levi and another guide brought Juan back to recover the bear. As they rolled the bear over to skin him, they could see that the bear had died while laying on top of Scott's boot. After reviewing the riveting and chilling facts surrounding this episode, I am left with a few questions. Do you think that this attack could have been avoided with bear spray? Do you think Scott should have left Juan on the beach or brought into the timber as a backup shooter? Do you think it is a good idea to follow a wounded brown bear into a dense patch of timber and brush? Do you think this episode has an eerie similarity to the episode we did on the bow hunter Ronnie Lemming? I will enjoy reading your posts, so please comment in the comment section below, and let's talk about it.